Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Let me, in my capacity as chairman of the Joint Select Committee on National Security, welcome you to this, our 20th meeting. As I formally reconvene this meeting, we having met as a committee prior to this. This is actually a follow-on hearing of this Joint Select Committee pursuant to this committee's inquiry into the management of the processes regarding the procurement, registration, retrieval, and storage of firearms, as well as forensic ballistic practices in Trinidad and Tobago, with specific reference to the prevalence of firearms on the streets, i.e. illegal firearms in Trinidad and Tobago. Represented here, as by now you would know, is the police service, the defense force, the customs and excise division, the strategic services agency, the Trinidad and Tobago prison service, the airport authority of Trinidad and Tobago, and the Port Authority of Trinidad and Tobago. We propose at some stage to ask the judiciary to represent itself in this follow-on as well. Let me indicate that this hearing will be broadcast live on Parliament Channel 11, Parliament Radio 105 FM, and Parliament YouTube Channel PalView. Let me welcome very sincerely each and every one of you. And I would like to ask, now you would notice some of you have been here with us before. You have noticed you are greater in number in the same space and therefore your comfort is not as assured as you would have liked it to be. But then Trinidad and Tobago is not at this stage in a comfortable place. So this is a small sacrifice for us to make. As well, I know an apology would have been extended to a few of you as individuals because those who were tasked with the responsibility of setting out these tables might not have been as acutely aware of ranks and privileges as exists in your military and paramilitary organizations. So no harm or no affront is meant and we hope that Wherever you are, you accept that we are here and the people of Trinidad and Tobago needs us. And if we suffer a little discomfort or a little embarrassment in respect of these <coughs> rank and standing and status issues, it's a very small price to pay in light of the larger mandate that is in front of us. I would like, therefore, to ask you each to introduce yourselves, and again, because you are not seated in the way that you might have otherwise, for the reasons I've just explained, I would like to begin by starting on my, in the front row on the right-hand side, and then we'll work our way accordingly. Please. Hi, good afternoon. I am Basdeo Ramdani, assist, acting Senior Superintendent in charge of the Traffic and Highway Patrol Branch. Please continue. Good afternoon. I'm Acting Senior Superintendent Simbonat Rajkumar in charge of the Interagency Task Force. Good afternoon. I am Leroy Brebno, Senior Superintendent. I'm the Police Armorer. In Raj Balaram, Senior Superintendent, Southwestern Division. George Robinson, Director, Strategic Services Agency. Andy Short, Manager at Strategic Services Agency. Austin Lee, Captain Senior Superintendent, Special Branch. <coughs> Good afternoon. Glenn Singh, Acting Comptroller, Customs and Excise Division. Good afternoon. My name is Alison Lewis, Chairman of the Port Authority of Trinidad. Good afternoon, Captain Hayden Pritchard, Acting Chief of Defense Staff. 
Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Commander Wayne Armour, Acting Commanding Officer, trying to be a Coast Guard, sir. Good afternoon, William Alexander, Acting Commissioner of Prisons. Good afternoon, Albert Griffith, Deputy General Manager, Security, Airports Authority of Trinidad and Tobago. Good afternoon, Nigel Ferguson, Chairman of Airports Authority of Trinidad and Tobago. McDonnell, Acting Assistant Superintendent of Prisons Procurement. Good afternoon, Mukesh Polaya, Assistant Commissioner of Prisons Administration. Good afternoon, Gerard Wilson, Deputy Commissioner of Prisons Administration, Acton. Good afternoon, Jason Coffey, Assistant Superintendent of Police, Firearms Unit. Good afternoon, Colonel Dexter Francis, the Acting Commanding Officer of the Trinidad and Tobago Regiment. Good afternoon, Leno Winchester, Assistant Director at the SSE. Good afternoon, Robert Williams, Assistant Superintendent, Professional Standard Bureau, Police. Good afternoon to everyone. Hayden Newton, General Manager of the Airports Authority of Trinidad and Tobago. Good afternoon, everyone. Ajit Prasad, Assistant Superintendent of Police, CID and CRO. Good afternoon, Charmaine Lewis, Acting General Manager, CEO, Port Authority of Trinidad and Tobago. Good afternoon, Randall Hector, Assistant Director, Legal at the Strategic Services Agency. Good afternoon, Ren Fonili, Legal Advisor, Authority of Trinidad and Tobago. Good afternoon, Avril Daly Brassi, CT, Piaco, and Good afternoon, Calvin Birch, Estate Security Superintendent, Acting Port Authority of Trinidad and Tobago. Of operatives, leaders in the national security platform in Trinidad and Tobago. I am Fitzgerald Talbot Hines, Chairman of this Joint Select Committee. Paul Richards, Member. Nigel Freitas, Member. Good afternoon, Nicole Oliver, Member. A couple of our members are unavoidably absent and might, in one case, be expected shortly. Uh, we are as well supported by the very able staff of the parliament led by our secretary to this committee, Madam Jackie Sampson Miguel, and of course the <clears throat> clerk of the Senate, um, Mr. Brian Caesar, and other support staff. Thank you all very much, ladies and gentlemen. The objectives of this inquiry are firstly to gain an understanding of the methodology and assessment of the approximate number of illegal firearms in and entering the country, their sources, and the means of the illegal importation. Number two, to gain an understanding of the targets and strategies of the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service, which is the lead agency, towards the elimination of illegal firearms in Trinidad and Tobago. Thirdly, to arrive at a consensus among all relevant parties concerning the critical importance of the implementation of proper forensic protocols in relation to the investigation and retrieval of illegal firearms with a view to minimizing gun crimes in Trinidad and Tobago. Let me pause to say that the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service, through the Minister of National Security, only on Friday, 
made it known to this committee that of the 245 by now plus murders that have taken place in these islands, Trinidad and Tobago, from the 1st of January to the 30th of June, as at that date, Friday, would have been about 245, of which 192 involved the use of firearms. Thirdly, or fourthly, to identify, and I stress, a collaborative effort in which the work of the various agencies represented here today, all involved in some way in law enforcement in accordance with the government's policy, can be enhanced in order to achieve the ultimate objective of the elimination of illegal firearms in Trinidad and Tobago. These objectives, as you would obviously know by virtue of your work and by virtue of your presence as alive citizens in this republic, would have come from the experience that we have been having for a number of years. And the anecdotal evidence is substantial. It is as rapid as hourly. Just by way of an example, just by way of an example, recently, Father Harvey had an encounter with criminals in this country. The reports are that the three men who were accosted and tied up and abused and threatened the life of the goodly father were all armed with firearms. And they called another man to the scene who also had a firearm. While you are waiting this meeting, I am told that you enjoyed the hospitality of the parliament, revealing to you some videos that would be circulating among persons on social media in the national community. And suffice it to say that the people of Trinidad and Tobago are now cringing in fear some talking about leaving the country, looking for a place elsewhere to live, to work. The pain is tremendous, burdensome. And I hold the view, my committee shares this view based on our internal deliberations, that we, through you, have the capacity to respond to this crisis, this epidemic that has now confronted Trinidad and Tobago. Members of the media, welcome. And uh, might we proceed, Mr. Singh? And uh, before we go, let me extend our, this committee's sincere apology to elements of the media. Um, you were invited, but we had some deliberations, so we apologize for your late approach to this room, and now we continue. Thank you very much. Mr. Singh. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As I was saying, and in line with what the Chairman of the Port would have said, we require technological help in determining uh, certain infractions that are possible as far as the importation of cargo is concerned. And we were making reference to the container scans, which uh, we were about to say that there are two types or two aspects to the container scanning operation. The first being a fixed scanner, which is embedded and it is constructed and it is present in the Port of Port of Spain, for which my understanding is that one set of approvals as it relates to the OSH regulations and the comments of one representative body again for that to be finalized. The standard operating procedures, the permission to be granted by the, uh, by the, the radiation expert, the nuclear physicist, all those things have been more or less passed. So it's just a matter of those final comments and the buy-in before uh, the staff can be actually um, employed or assigned to do that particular work. So it's a matter of just that. That is very far advanced. 
In the case of the mobile scanners, the Customs and Excise Division currently owns four mobile scanners, which were donated by the U.S. Customs Border Protection Agency um, at about the same time, 2015, late 2015, and for which the state would have paid the refurbishment costs for those units. They are in the territory, they are in our possession, uh, and they have not been rolled out as yet because the technology that is employed with the mobile scanners is slightly different to that of the fixed scanner in that the mobile scanners contain a live radioactive source for which protocols as determined by the nuclear physicists again must be complied with before operations. To also say that two of those scanners will be employed at the port of Port of Spain and two will be employed at the port of on Lisas. The intention is that scanning will be, scanning will be done on both aspects of our operation. That is, export cargo and import cargo. As it stands with the mobile units, we were advised by the, the manufacturers of the product that they ought not to be operated unless a valid maintenance contract is in place. We have been trying to have that contract actually signed off. And in fact, uh, in fact, up to Friday last week, um, I was inquiring again because, as you know, any contract like that must be done with the approval of the Attorney General's Office and uh, the Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Finance because they are our units. My understanding is that um, it should be signed any time now. Documents are presented to both parties. We have more or less come to an agreement as to what those conditions are. Initially, there were some, uh, what you would say, slight differences between what the parent company would have laid out in their contract as against what the state would normally do in contracts of, of this nature. So, two questions sure. on that matter. There is a perception by the public that the delay in the implementation of these scanners had to do with elements within the organization resisting it. What is your reaction to that? That is totally untrue, Mr. Chairman. I untrue. can unequiv unequivocally state that. Second question. Based on your knowledge and experience, how soon can we expect to get past those troubling issues to, to where we ought to be? Full implementation. Well, I will answer that by saying if the contract were to be signed, and I was about to say it, funds have been allocated since I assumed office, funds have been allocated since the last fiscal for securing that contract. It is being held there pending this contract being signed. So as soon as that contract is signed, the arrangements will be made for all parties to come, for parties to come here to sign it, and then it will be rolled out in their presence. Finally, what is the immediate next step in terms of having that contract signed? Again, I will have to refer to my, to my parent ministry and also to continue the, the discussions with the Attorney General's office. Mr. Singh, if I could interject, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you for your candor. And uh, this question is also posed to Ms. Lewis. One of the concerns I have with this is, given the magnitude of this shift in paradigm in the operations of the port, in any project management efficiency protocol, one would assume, one would have assumed that given the fact that, according to Ms. Lewis and yourself, this equipment has been here since 2015, there would have been a well thought out, well planned rollout and management of this. And given what seems to be the challenges that have been encountered, that possibly did not happen. Inclusive of collaboration with stakeholders to, to deal with the radiation aspect of this and the safety aspect of this, the licenses and regulatory framework, etc. Was due diligence performed with the acquisition and or implementation plan of these very important scanners, the container scanner and the mobile scanners, 
to your knowledge and, and you, it may have preceded your tenure but certainly it's indicative of some sort of flaw in the process in implementation of some something of this magnitude and might i say that this committee's business involves making recommendations to the parliament one of them will be swift implementation of the use of the scanners. Thank you, Chair. I appreciate that. Senator, I will not be able to comment on that because it would have uh, predated my assumption on the particular portfolio I now hold. Um, suffice it to say that I would have expected that that would have been in, done and would have been in place before. Lewis. Well, I have to say the same because I only assumed office two months ago. When one assumes office, I am sure there can or possibly be documentation of some sort of process for the acquisition and implementation of something of this magnitude. Would you have been able to come across any such documentation and or liaise with stakeholders to find out if these sorts of collaborations would have taken place to make this process, which is now two years in the making and counting, less challenging and troublesome? Well, I can say, uh, so that uh, when you know, we were called to this committee, I did request some of the information. And um, you know, the information is there. We, we did do a lot of collaboration, from my understanding, um, like I said, I didn't interrogate all the information in time for today's meeting. But um, my understanding is that there was collaboration between the Customs and Excise and the Port Authority and the Port Security, um, you know, in rolling out, you know, this, this exercise. But not everything stops, you know, at the port. There, there, there were approvals and there were different um, levels at which you know the, these things have to be taken, and, and once once we did our part together with the customs, you know it went to the next step as far as I know. Um, Meanwhile, um, Mr. Singh, given what we know now about the um, value of the gun trade being in excess of a hundred million, and given what we know about um, the substantial um, percentage of these guns um, coming through legal ports. Um, can you enlighten the public as to what percentage of containers are scanned? Searched. Well seen. A few years. No, what we would see, what we'll find. But uh, on, based on the intelligence that we have from all the other agencies, that is the sole lifeline that we already have now, short of actually examining and discovering. So it will be speculative of me to really, to really give a, a, an, an answer to, to that particular question, Senator, with all due respect. Now, just before we go, just for the benefit of the committee, um, typically, you, containers are, they arrive at the port, and then whatever process takes place, they leave sealed to go to their destinations. Is that correct? Some of them? Those that have been granted delivery, um, it is the onus is on them now to remove because we would have no further interest in those containers. So some leave the port sealed? Yes. And go to a store possible. on Henry Street or a yard in Valsin or some business place in anywhere? Yes. Okay. And in those circumstances, one of your officers is supposed to be there as it is unstuffed? Not necessarily. Those that would have been granted what we call a green, a free clearance, um, they are free to dispose of the contents as they see fit. Because sometimes I'm driving up, say, Henry Street in Port of Spain and see a container being unstuffed and guys carrying away the stuff. In those circumstances, it's possible that that can have been granted a green. It is possible. Because these are one of the people you perceive to be a good guy. It is possible, yes. And among the... Become, we term we use as compliant. Among compliant, and therefore among the 40%. Yes. That's very risky in today's Trinidad and Tobago. 
But apart from that, I know the practicality of searching oil, and you can't do it. You've said so. Apart from that, are there cases where the custom officer is supposed to be there as it is being on stuff? I've seen that in my time before. Well, I would want to be very honest, um, Chairman. It is explained to every single officer what their functions are as it relates to a particular examination. From time to time, we will get reports that there might be transgressions to that instruction, in which case it is dealt with. It is dealt with upon receiving those news. But our instructions that would go to the staff is that you must remain, if it is one of those containers that go to premises for examination, you must remain until the very end, having examined every single aspect. But there have been occasions when you say the word transgression, where the officer did not stay the course. He didn't stay and observe. I would agree with that, Chairman. And what typically was the sanction in those cases? Well, it depends because when those when news like that will come to us, we will redeploy uh, units from our, from our enforcement arm to actually go and pick up that slug. So it is it is um, depending on the lag. Someone is always there to to complete the task. But if the lag is long enough, nobody would have been there. Well, again, I wouldn't want to dwell on that, uh, Chairman, because. Um, that is from the new dispensation that we have. Is a, it, it is a behavior that is severely frowned upon. I want to dwell on it <laughs> because the country has a serious illegal firearm problem. Yes, Chairman. And, and I, therefore, I, I, I totally must dwell. Agree. This committee wants to dwell on it. I totally it agree. It sounds to me that those transgressions accords and affords even an opportunity for illegal firearms of all descriptions like we have seen from the SSA's presentation to come among us. So we have to find a way of eliminating that possibility if we have to deal with the question of illegal firearms in Trinidad and Tobago. In other words, we just can't go on that way. So we would like to get from you, for the benefit of this committee, an outline of the procedure that is supposed to be the ought. And we would like in your normal candor some examples of the negative is, where it went wrong. In writing, and we would like your recommendations or your suggestions to this committee as to what must be done to eliminate that possibility. Because from the entertainment videos you saw in the room next door, the thing could be pretty ugly and pretty dangerous. You see, Senator Richards. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, quick question for Mr. Robinson first, uh, based on the presentation we saw earlier on, which was quite comprehensive, and I guess quite a bit of it is security sensitive, so I'll be careful, Mr. Chairman. When did this, when was this, when did this pro that research project start? I believe it started, uh, Senator, around two to three months ago. Two to three months ago. And there has been communication of some of the information, if not all, to the Commission of Police? A lot of the information was shared at the National Security Council. Uh, are you, the last time you were here, you spoke of challenges in terms of agencies working in silos. And you would have liked to see, you would like to have seen a better collaboration in terms of information sharing and information gathering protocols. Do you think that has improved, given the fact that the, the police representatives here uh, don't seem to have been exposed to what I consider critical information, and these are some Southwestern Division Senior Superintendent, Senior Superintendent Armory, Senior Superintendent Interagency Task Force, Senior Superintendent Acting Highway and Traffic, and Special Branch have not been exposed to what would have been some critically disaggregated information that can help in their divisions in the fight against crime. Do you get a sense that the, the information is being used and I'm not, I'm not trying to put you in the spot in any way, in the most effective manner. 
My responsibility, Senator, is to, to share the information with the designated representatives of the agencies. It's not my responsibility to share it down at the granular level. Uh, so my sharing is to the persons whom the commissioner indicated I must share with. I understand that part of, part of any good research is ongoing feedback, in, and I would presume this is a longitudinal study of some sort, is that you will get information from the police service or you will be able to track through the same methodologies that Mr. Short has outlined earlier on to see if, the, to, to check the efficacy of the flow of information to the agencies and if it is having an impact in the fight against crime, even though it's three months down the road. Would you agree with that? Uh, Senator, when, when we're satisfied that this research is, is robust enough, are you robust enough and complete? We will share the information in its entirety to the designated representatives of the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service. Part of our, in, in our cycle is to get feedback. So we must get feedback from the people who work on the ground to determine if at all the research is robust and to make adjustments in, with some of the assumptions that we would have made in arriving at our conclusions. So yes, we intend to get the feedback and we intend to share this research in its entirety. This research went through several iterations and went through several divisions in the Strategic Services Agency. So we are not even satisfied yet that we are complete. Thank you. Uh, earlier on, th there was an indication of 245 murders, 192, which is, equates to 78 percent committed by illegal firearms. Part of the presentation indicated that 1.7 percent uh, of the illegal firearms are used in the commission, or is used in the commission of 169, 10 uh, percent of all crimes question is now for the police hierarchy. How important is this kind of information in terms of your strategies in the TT police service in getting firearms? Because the main subject of our inquiry here is getting illegal firearms out of the hands of criminals. This kind of information that you would have seen disaggregated earlier today, in terms of understanding the, I don't want to use the word hotspots, but the areas of more concern where you can focus your energies and resources. Uh, the full response to that question would be from the Commissioner of Police at, at this present time. Um, As a practicing, significant, high-ranking member of the police service, how important will the information you saw earlier on today be in your strategy formulation or your operations this, even, this. even if the information has to come through the correct channels. Yes. Yes. Will the information you saw today, is it of great value to you at your level in terms of operation and the objective of removing illegal firearms from the streets of Trinidad and Tobago? It is, sir. It is. It is. Because what is also of interest and would be of interest to the Commissioner of Police is the mere fact the knowledge share about the 40 percent containers that get green light I, I i i listen to that and that confirms and compounds the situation that we are in at this present state because if 40 percent of your containers can go on search then you could imagine what really goes on. It, 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 the numbers that we are finding on a daily basis and the numbers that the strategic services has put up could triple. Under 10% of the illegal firearms committing the vast majority of crimes, what does that tell you, and anyone from the TT Police Service can answer this, about the approach that should be taken in terms of solvency and detection rates to, to identify those persons 
who are users of those firearms, illegal users of those firearms. Again, I go back to what the Strategic Services has, has put forward and the strategies that the Commissioner have been rolling out since the year started. And if we put all those uh, efforts together, it, it would be a plus to us and the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago because it is of great importance. But I would like to know who, who decides, um, who makes the decision as to who we are not, whose containers we are not going to search. Who makes the decision as to whose containers we are not going to search? Okay, there is a risk management committee for which separate, defined, clearly defined criteria are input into our system for doing such. So, so those criteria, as I said, based upon um, your pattern, your history with us, um, your compliance, previous compliance rating, that is all factored in. That is all factored in before that determination is made. Given the fact that the gun trade is $100 million upwards annually, it is obvious that the persons who are running the, the gun trade are not small people. So is it not common sense since uh, we see that a significant amount of seizures come through customs and so on? Is it not common sense that the 40% are the persons, the rich people, are the persons who you should really be having your eyes on? Well, Senator, if I may, that is a highly subjective statement again. And in our, in our methods of risk management, we are extremely careful that we deal with the facts in front of us. And that may not, I mean, we don't, have a, we don't have any criteria for rich people. It will be what we see in front of us. And you would also know that the relationship we have with a lot of the manufacturing and industrial concerns in Trinidad and Tobago, it might mean that that percentage I'm speaking about would be from established importers and captains of industry and those highly compliant industries and importers in Trinidad and Tobago. So are you saying that it is beyond the capability or the, the malintent of captains of industry to be importing illegal firearms? That is not what I said, Senator. Well, it seems that that's no, what no, you're no, suggesting. Sir. No, sir. If only to say that it doesn't mean that at any one stage that this will be a total free ride, you know. This, again, when the cycle comes around, from time to time, there will be inspections at these, at these, exactly, yes, yes. For people who would normally become, exactly, sir, yeah. yeah. Sure. Um, I just want to ask two questions. First, I want to quantify some of these percentages by asking how many, con how many containers come to the port on a yearly basis so that the public can understand what 40% <coughs> really means in terms of number of containers that uh, get the green light. And I just want to side with my other colleagues in regards to 40% being a large number that is getting green light in relation to the criteria. It, it stands to reason to me that if, if someone is going to be involved in illegal activity, that the very thing that they want to do is be compliant. They are not going to, for example, if you're transporting drugs in a car, break red lights. They're going to make sure they go through every green light properly and follow all of the traffic laws. So again, it just stands to reason from that standpoint that those that are compliant are the ones to look at. And maybe you need to look at the criteria and the amount of times you do random checks on the compliant list. Point taken, Senator, and just to also assure you that these criteria are frequently um, reviewed. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. Uh, to the ten representative of the Toronto Bigger Police Service, once again, the part of the presentation indicated that San Fernando, uh, 640 illegal firearms, 46 C's, uh, Chaguanas, 452, 43 C's, Coover, 354, 23 C's. In terms of particularly the Southwestern Division, what are the current strategies in the TNT Police Service in relation to getting these firearms out of the hands of criminals? Now, before I um, answer your question, 
Before I assume office in Southwestern Division, which is about eight months ago, you know, the talk was lots of guns coming through Cedrus. Cedrus has one legal court. And of course, there are many other smaller ports which could, could come in. But there's one road. And of course, I target vehicles, random stop and search on that single road out of Cedrus. And the result, the results were minimal, very minimal. So the question is, where are these guns coming? How are they coming? We get more sheep and maybe illegal immigrants coming through the illegal ports, but not the firearms. So the question is, where are, where are these guns coming to the country? Other than the main road, people do all manners of things. People do all manners of things. But yes, the public perception was this tip of the island so close to Venezuela provided this very easy thing. But we are not unaware that there are several other illegal ports of entry. And each police division ought to be paying attention where they have coastlines, obviously, to that and assisting the SSA in the mapping that they have been talking about. Every single police division with a seafront ought to be taking particular note on the basis of its own intelligence as to these illegal ports of entry and adding them to the mapping that is now taking place. But Chairman, could you just answer the question, the specific question also? What is the current strategy in the Southwestern Division in getting illegal guns out of the hands of criminals. You mentioned stop and search earlier. It, it is a, a <coughs> high point of concern in, in the aggregation, disaggregation we saw earlier on. What is your current strategy? Of course, every week we revise our strategies. It depends on the information we get. Of course, we do the random stop and search. We have intelligence. Right? We partner with the community. Right? Detection. In Southwestern, we have a high detection rate, but in around 65%. And we use detection as prevention also. Well, from the information I got in the presentation there, 1,500 approximately illegal guns and only 112 Cs. So I don't know how it matches up with what you're saying with that 65% detection rate and or seizure of these weapons based on the presentation I saw earlier on. Well, um, I think I lost your, your point here. Right. The point was that San Fernando, 640 illegal weapons, and Central and Chaguanas and the, the other areas in Southwestern and, and Central Trinidad have high concentrations according to the presentation of illegal weapons, with less than 10% of those being seized. So I'm not seeing the, the parallel with the high detection which you just outlined, and the seizure of illegal weapons, which is the main ill in the commission of crimes in this country. Okay, for, for last year, we seized 105 illegal firearms. Now, all those firearms, persons were not charged. It doesn't mean to say once we get like a firearm, someone is charged, right? So that could vary the detection rate as to the percentage of uh, the amount of guns we get. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, naturally, I have a particular interest in um, the operations in the Southwestern Division. And given what you said about the extensive coastlines and the limited number of roads, now you indicated that you do some amount of targeted searching. You do your random stop and seizures. Two things I'd like to find out. One, um, what exactly is the profile that you look after when you're doing your random stop and search? And secondly, what facilities do you have at your disposal to assist you in finding the weapons when you do, in fact, conduct a stop and search? Do you employ canines to assist you in detecting those weapons when you do that? Yes, of course. At times we employ the, the canine. We don't get them every time, but at times we employ the canine. 
Do you indicate the frequency of use of canines since you mentioned you don't get them every time? I know there are challenges with having them delivered from Probably once, remote. twice a month. Once, twice a month we get them. What percentage of your search then is done with the use of canines? I would say about 25% or so. Um, as for the profile, yeah, we a random stop and search, there's no profile. We check at random, regardless of how you look, race, creed, we check. Yes, I just wanted to um, ask a question in relation to firearms within the police service. Um, you indicated in your submission on May the 17th, 2017, that eight firearms registered to the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service were lost, and only two were recovered. So my question is, um, when were these firearms lost? Have the lost firearms been linked to any criminal activity? And what has been put in place to prevent a recurrence of lost firearms in the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service? Okay, of, of those eight that were lost, if I could recall, one was at the shooting, one was lost when Sergeant Man Waring got killed. That weapon was found, that, is a sub, is that weapon is before the court at present. Uh, there was a weapon that was also lost when PC Benjamin got killed. That weapon has not yet been located Two were lost, if I can recall, were lost at sea. Were lost at sea. And um, Okay. One was lost at the Northern Division. That was on the 11th of the 11th month, 2016, uh, with 15 rounds of ammunition. That was not, never found. Uh, one was also lost at the Central Division on the 10th, 9th, 2012, 17 rounds of ammunition. That was not found also. Uh, one was lost from the special branch. I didn't have a date for that quoted here, but that was lost with 15 rounds of ammunition. One was lost from the traffic and highway patrol branch on the 10 1 2015. That was recovered and is before is a matter before the court. Southern Division were accounting for four of the losses. Two were of uh, murdered police officers, and two, one was lost on the 26-11-2015, an MP5 was lost at sea. They were doing an exercise where they were going to board a ship, and the strap burst on one of the weapons. It fell in the sea. The divers tried to assist them. We never recovered that. And the other one was lost at, uh, lost at sea in Maruga, some like, other exercise they had there. Sir, so, so here, you would have heard the figure that was revealed by the SSA earlier sir. in terms of its current assessment, though we know it's a work in progress. Yes, sir. Um, whenever the police spoke publicly about the number of firearms seized, I get the impression the police is elated at the fact that it found 745 weapons last year. Um, if the figure that we heard today is accurate and there are views, as I said, that the figure is substantially past that, that is at a minimum, right? I think I should ask, generally speaking, does the police consider the figure that we heard today to be in the ballpark or way above or way below? But the, the, uh, the police, I, I being the armorer, uh, if the commissioner was sitting here, you, you ought to be of concern, of, of some concern, sir. Right. Because here is it that you're, you're, you're telling me, you're saying that 
uh, this amount of firearms is in the country. That should send shivers through Great. all of us. And therefore, if you divide that number by 745, it'll take a number of years before we can clean that up while more are coming, right? Yep. So, so, you will agree with me that we are in no position to be sanguine, no position to be comforted, no position to be happy. Exactly so. At our current throughput. Yes, I agree with you, sir. And therefore, the focus of this is for us to collaborate so that we can come up with a strategy. This is why Senator Richards wanted to know what typically was the current strategy for dealing with this matter. I suspect it is the routine stops and searches. It has to do with intelligence. Yeah, intelligent gathering. You have hot of warrants, spots, search warrants, and you would you you, you would use your locks. you would use your comstat because once once you have crimes happening in your district division or any part of Trinidad and Tobago, it is based on the 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 the, 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 the from Kappa what intelligence you are gathering, and then you would put all together, and you would have now to plan strategies as targeting the main areas that were highlighted by the SSA. So, but, 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 getting to, 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 to the, the, the meat of all of this, what frightens me most of all, yes, we were boasting about 745, not frightened, troubled you. Yes. Because you can't get frightened. You're a senior police <laughs> officer in this. Yeah. Okay. So say, I know what right. you mean. You mean troubled and you. Look at, yes. Looking at what the SSA has presented to us. But what concerns me most, and I, and, and I should concern the whole of Trinidad and Tobago, is that 40%. That is my biggest problem right now. That 40%. Because if I am important and I could get through once or twice unchecked, I'm expecting to get through the third time fully loaded. Well, there's another problem. Just as there is the internet, there is another system akin to the internet that is called the dark net, where persons can get into that dark net and simply order weapons which will come to your door in the mail. I am fully aware of that. It, 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 so it's happening. The containers are just one thing, and then you have the issue of the fishermen around the country. Exactly. With a layer of fish on top and everything else below. All of these things are happening, and therefore we have, we are trying to work out what is the current strategy of this platform, all of us, to dealing with that, and then collaboratively work on improving that strategy so that we can impact on this problem. Mr. Chairman, I have a, yes. a question. Um, yes. Since we're on the point of strategy and fishermen and so on, um, it's a question that I would like to direct to the commanding officer of the Coast Guard. And sorry, before you go, not necessarily fishermen, but people with yes, boats. Yes, exactly, people and that's, that's what I'm getting at. Pleasure craft, yes. fishing craft. I, when I um, drive along the coast, I see there are a number of mariners where there are quite uh, a number of, of boats owned by private individuals, and, and the types of boats suggest that they are owned by um, affluent members of society. And I have observed that they go out and sp spend sometimes a day or two and come back in. And I know some of them, and they boast of largely being unchecked. What is the policy if you own, let's say, a, a pleasure craft, like a, a yacht or something, and you, you go out for a couple of days and then come back in? Do you not search each of these boats on, on entry, on re-entry? Thank you very much for the question. Let me just share some data that I have, which relates to the searches that you are asking about. So for the year 2014, the Trinidad Bay Coast Guard intercepted 328 vessels of interest, which fit a particular profile. So therefore, we are able to seg segregate 
those who are transiting in and out, and also those who are behaving in a particular pattern that will cause interest. In, in that year, 18 of those, and this is of interest to the committee, of course, were found with narcotics on board. And interesting enough, none were formed with firearms or ammunition. For the year 2015, the Coast Guard intercepted again 175 vessels of interest, of which 14 were found with narcotics on board. For the year 2016, that number went to 295, of which 16 were found with narcotics, and in two of those cases, ammunition only. You, well, you used two very interesting words, profiling yes. and segregating. Yes. So that's why I directed my question about the affluent members of this country who own yachts and not fishermen or Venezuelans who come in on pirogues and dealing with the pleasure crafts. The right. persons who I told you who boast about they can leave and come back in and are never searched. Right. Well, those numbers would not be the full profile of persons in your um, categorization that are never searched. They are uh, searched. The your, your sample size profile, might be... Which, which profile you are speaking of? The searched? one that you have just... Um, which one is it? The one that you just um, the one described. Percent? No, not the one percent. You use the word affluent and pleasure craft. Mm -hmm. So we do search pleasure craft. I'm sure you would agree with me. Your sample size might be quite different to those that we do actually search. Right. Are there specific me? points that you, you make these searches, or is it at the mariners only, or at other ports, or other areas around the country? We do the... If I may, um, pretty familiar with this, having just departed the Coast Guard. Um, the ch searches can happen at any point. Uh, what we don't do is target mar mariners. So most of these searches are done at, on transit. And there is no, nothing excuses a pleasure craft, whether it's a yacht, um, a wealthy citizen, from being searched. Um, one of the things the Coast Guard was trying to get addressed, however, and, and this is a great opportunity to raise it, and I, I, I like where you're heading, is the regulation of the ple pleasure boat um, industry and that craft. The regulation is very limited. Uh, so to get a driver's license for a vehicle, you have to go through a lot more steps than somebody from one of those uh, communities just getting in about 12, 13, whatever age and going wherever they please down the island and so on. Um, so um, we need legislative teeth to support some of our operations, but the, to answer your question, yes, we, we search any vessel, and we have found narcotics on all types of vessels. Um, but is it organized how you are describing? No, it's not. Um, sometimes it's the experience of the coxswain of the vessel, where the vessel is coming from, a number of criteria. Um, can we do more? Yes, but we don't target any community to say we're going to search them or over-search them. It's a random search. <coughs> um, one of the things coming out from this discussion that I like is, is your notion of collaboration. As I just said, one of the things that would help us is regulation. Um, for instance, the registration of these vessels and so on. So you can, you can build up trends and a database of who you've searched, what you've found, and so on. So the answer is yes, we are doing more. We, we, um, but random searches can only get you so far with increased uh, legislation, with increased intelligence, all together working together. What you end up building is a body of knowledge and practice. And it doesn't happen in isolation. So the answer is yes, sir. Can I just ask a question? How many of those searches occur in Tobago's waters? By and large, you'll find maybe 15% will occur in Tobago's waters. The numbers will also increase during the flying fish season when there's an attraction in our waters, of course. Okay. Um, but I, I will share with you that the number of arrests of those that I have said were found with narcotics were primarily found generally around Trinidad. 
and the north coast of Trinidad as well. And the reason I'm asking that is because you can also land these contraband in Tobago. As a matter of fact, you can go as far as to take one of the ferries, so you can land the guns in Tobago, stock up a car, take it onto the ferry, and bring it across to Trinidad. Because as far as I understand, how much searches happens on the ferry in terms of cars? How many of us have taken cars onto the ferry? And most that happened by way of searches, they open the trunk, nothing, close it down, go on the boat, and you come off in Trinidad. Port Authority. The fact of the matter is that the searches on those on those ferries are random and, and, and they're not as thorough maybe um, as you know one would one would expect. There is a uh, I'm, I'm not I'm not sure about the frequency. All right. Two but two issues two, let me let me say this in answer to this in response to this. Two issues are emerging here from what we have heard in relation to the containers, in relation to the, huh? Inter relation to the island, inter island ferry, in relation to the police approach to roadblocks and everything. There are two issues emerging here. One, the question, the simple old question of productivity, are we putting sufficient time and energy and effort and man hours into this? Are the personnel who we have among us really on the job recognizing that this is an epidemic that is coming to our doors? That's the first question. The next issue is the question of the integrity of the personnel. Because a lot that we are hearing here today largely depends on the integrity of the officers, for an example, who will intercept a vessel out at sea for the Coast Guard. They could simply turn a blind eye. The captain of that vessel could simply, knowing with information available to him that something is coming at 12.30, he could take the vessel back to port for repairs at 11 o'clock. And the police could escort a carload of arms safely to its base, including in a police vehicle. So two issues are arising here from all that we have heard so far. The question of whether we, as the law enforcement platform, are generating sufficient energy and effort in earnest behind this epidemic, this gun problem. And secondly, are our personnel reliable in so far as their integrity is concerned? Mr. Pritchard, your comment, please. I saw in your eyes you wanted to respond. Uh, uh, the example, the, the specific example. From the perspective of the Coast Guard then, yeah. how do you react to that proposition? Oh, very true, very true. Um, <coughs> we have taken certain measures. So that activity you just described here will be very difficult to do now for reasons which I can't go into. Um, so those kind of patterns, especially if repeated more than once, whether it is for a breakdown or something, are flagged. So does it happen? I'm sure it does. Does it happen very frequently? That would be highly unlikely based on things we have introduced in that example you give. But, but corruption of public officials, the Coast Guard is not immune to that. Um, we have done a few things, but for me to sit here and tell you that it doesn't happen would, would of course, not be true. And it is probably, probably the single most um, important, difficult, central team that we need, need to uh, um, address because these people have so much resources. Uh, they are competing um, and they are providing uh, great rewards for people who comply. And so it's a, it's a continuous battle. Madam Lewis, on behalf of the Port Authority, mm -hmm. what is your reaction to the proposition that I have as I have stated it? 
Well, uh, basically... Are your officers, you... are your security personnel exerting with any real seriousness the kind of effort that this epidemic calls for? At this point, I would say no, sir. I think that, that we, we have two issues. You raise the issue of uh, productivity and the use of personnel. Um, I don't think that at this time the, the, the number of the, the persons are adequately trained to deal with some of the issues that, that we have. It is an issue of training. And also in terms of the numbers of people who are deployed and how they are deployed. And um, the, well, I mean, as, as, as Captain Pritchard said, the whole question of of the integrity of personnel is something, it's an issue that we will have. So, Singh, from the perspective of the Coast Guard, what is your reaction to that proposition? Custom, custom, custom. custom sorry. Uh, Chairman, what I would simply oh, really? say that from my own oh, end, and I take every opportunity to relay to my colleagues in management the seriousness of two particular issues. I would say three. The issues of firearms, the issues of narcotics and the issues of medication that is also currently, um, well, we have had reports of certain things taking place. And I take every opportunity to explain to them that this is not where we want to go. It needs reinforcing, I would say. And if I may also say that it may mean that we as a team will have to actually step down to relay this message um, to the operational level. Human beings are involved. Again, like Captain Pritchard said, I will not um, say that, I cannot sit here and say that um, maybe things are not happening. I cannot say that. But um, to minimize and to also explain to officers the seriousness of these particular offenses, this is being done on a very, very regular basis. Um, issues of person, personal integrity, again, it has to be actually uh, more or less preached. It has to be actually reinforced, and this is an ongoing exercise. Police, what is your reaction to this proposition? Coming to the airport's authority next. <laughs> well, I know for a fact that efforts are being made to try and stamp out what we call the rogue elements in the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service. So I know that the Commission and, his, and the other executive officers are putting things together so we can have the kind of output that we ought to have given to this nation as law, as the number one law enforcement agency. So, we are not immune And to on the productivity side, is the, I mean, the, the public wants to know, in this situation we are in, that our agencies, those who are paid and sworn to protecting us, they want to know that we are exerting best efforts. The service is, And sir. in so far as effort and productivity is concerned, how do you react to my proposition? Well, it's sort of 50-50 because we have the, the, the officers who are dedicated, who would get up and come out on a day and give you the 100% and more that they need to give you. And then on the other hand, we would have the other, others who would just... Thank you. Airports Authority, in terms of Mr. Ferguson, and I see you have your... Chief of Security with you. What of the airport's authority, what is your reaction to this, that we may not be putting in the level of energy behind this epidemic that we are facing in the country? And secondly, the integrity of those who are responsible for dealing with it. What is your reaction to that? Well, the airport's authority is not immune to what is happening in the country uh, as we sit here today. We are a subset of society. And uh, to sit here and say that we are, of course, sitting idly by and not observing what is happening will be, uh, certainly is not going to be something that I will agree to. We have our challenges as, as the country does. 
But we have also identified that there are some issues and areas that we need to tighten up on, and we are doing ju just that. We are looking at our protocols, our security protocols. We are reviewing them as we speak. And hopefully, with once that has been completed, we will be in a better position to identify some of the weak areas that exist at the airport's authority. In terms of its personnel and how it looks at addressing the skills that is before us, I am not in a position to say whether or not the security at the airport's authority is in any way involved in the nefarious activities that are existing. Needless to say that I'm sure that there are some who are involved in this sort of activity that will put all of us at risk where the security of the nation is concerned. Um, when, that, when that has been found, however, they are dismissed. Well, the process has to be, be, um, be, be looked at, and it's not a matter of just dismissing them without due cause, but it is not looked at easy. We don't look at it um, without, of course, taking in, into consideration the seriousness of the matter before us. It is dealt with seriously. The airport security staff is one which the, 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 the head of the airport security staff are all seasoned and experienced people. They know what is before them. They understand what, is, what, what they have to deal with. And as such, we pay particular attention to the same members of our security to make sure that we don't have this sort of thing that we're experiencing in Trinidad and Tobago happen at the airport. Mr. Chairman, um, yes. Feel free, Mr. I noticed there's a... Um, the Head of the Professional Standards Bureau. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, it's uh, as I understand it. It's not, it's not just his job to police the police, but to police other um, arms, of, um, other law enforcement agencies. But um, can I ask, in terms of um, the concept of explain your wealth, um, are you satisfied that is that enough is being done by the? professional standards be or, or do you need uh, more assistance whether by legislation or, or resources to um, police the police in terms of getting certain officers who live above their means to explain their wealth well at the professional standard bureau we investigate officers on reports that come to us right? we don't really go there in a proactive manner as such we investigated officers and reports and these investigations are painstaking and we have to go through every channel before we can put an officer before the court. Right? We liaise with the director of public prosecution on a regular basis who advise us on where to go when to go forward. Whose job is it to police the police in the sense of um, getting certain officers who live beyond their means. You see them in, in luxury cars, um, C-class and E-4s and so on. And you, you can't afford that, uh, an installment for those sort of vehicles on your salary. Um, whose job is it to, to ask questions of these officers? Where are you getting money to pay for that? First of all, we have to um, prove. We, have, we will have to prove before we can... We can take them further through the courts and so on, but officers living beyond their means, they really um, know the way how to, to get around the situation as such. But very rarely, what situation? very rarely... Get around get what situation, sir? <coughs> Repeat that. Get around what situation? No, they might be aware of how to handle the, um, the law. In a, in a sort of way. They yes, will, they will yes, they'll say they're planting badgy and, 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 and time and but, so but on. But I, I, want, um, I, I want to stick up in there. Um, you don't necessarily need explain your wealth legislation. There's the Proceeds of Crime Act. Yes, That's we all. have that have to, uh, to, to support. No, you don't necessarily have to come in. And um, l likewise, um, there are a number of police officers who I know claim to own businesses. Do you? If a police officer owns a business, 
and the business is thriving, uh, one wonders what, um, why would he want to stay in the police service, but he continues to stay. And that should raise red flags as to maybe he's profiting from being a police officer, and, and that allows him to funnel um, through his business and make his business thrive. So I, I'm wondering, um, in terms of a database, um, do you know of officers who own businesses or who live above their means and, and, and what is being done with respect we, to them? We are, we are aware of officers who own businesses, but um, officers can own business by um, applying to the commissioner for permission to own a business and to run a business. That is a legal mean by whereby an officer can own a business. How closely do you work with the Police Convenience Authority now? We are the a small unit. It's only 18 of us. How closely do you work with the Police Convenience Authority? We are sort of uh, related. We are in the same building and, and um, no, not complete, sorry. Police Complaints Division is at the same building. The Co Police Complaints Authority they are they liaise with us on a daily basis. We have to supply them with information on that they request and so on. Why do you suppose Mr. David West has consistently since his appointment complained about the abhorrence cooperation uh, between the police service and the police complaints authority consistently <coughs> thwarting investigations to convict and exonerate police officers accused of crime? Well, that is beyond me. That should go to the commissioner and Mr. David West. That is beyond me. So it Femme appears as though there is... Go ahead, madam. If I may ask a question, how many officers have been uh, convicted of offences then from your investigation? Well, several. Most of them are still before the court. For the, the PSB was formed in 2011, and since then we have hundred and roughly 150 officers before the court. We have, with, with a few convictions, of course. And it appears from the consensus, from the expressions that we heard from all of you, representing your various entities, that integrity issues are central to our weakness in dealing with the illegal gun problem in the country. Is that a fair assessment? Is that a fair assessment? Great. And therefore, we have a recommendation to make in that regard. And it appears from the consensus that clearly, like everywhere else in our country, productivity, work rate, is another major contributor to the condition we are in. Is that agreed? I see, a, I see everybody else saying, North, South, and I see a one East, West. Please. Thank you very much. I, I would wish to say that for the, for the Trinidad Coast Guard, by extension, the Trinidad Defense Force, whose members work 24 7, we don't uh, suffer the, the benefits of overtime. The work rate of those members is, I think, one which the country can be proud about notwithstanding the subject matter that you are dealing with, because the Defense Force is engaged in a wide spectrum of activities. Um, our directed efforts to various, to various missions is nothing short of sometimes stellar and even inspiring for us as leaders, sir. Mr. Mr. Chairman, if I could. Go ahead, Mr. Chairman. We, we have dealt a lot with the issue of illegal weapons, and I'd like some information from the members of the TT Police Service or representing the TT Police Service. Based on the Commissioner's submission dated May 17, 2017, he indicated the issue of incidents involving private security firms where persons in the field with firearms are non-holders of FUECs, which are, with the, which are the authorized licenses at present being monitored by the TT Police Service. What exactly is done to monitor these security firms, which is of grave concern to me based on the fact that if you look around the country, and it has been quite a bit of conversation and talk radio, there seems to be an ease with which someone can be hired by these smaller security firms, and in many instances have access to 
being precepted. And so the question is, what is being done to monitor these security firms and the supposed firearms uh, they've been authorized to use? Uh, I would not at this time be able to respond to you because I, I know for a fact the commissioner has certain plans in mind where that is concerned. So that question I, I, I think would be, he is be, would be most fitting to respond to you in that, on that basis, sir. Given the fact that there is a profluence of private security firms at different levels, given all of your experiences and, and uh, credentials, is that a point of concern for you? at this time in this country, given the fact that there is a concern that articulated that they are not as regulated, nearly as regulated as, this, as they should be, it seems that they are, in some instances, non-processed, non-nationals, being hired by these security firms who also have access to firearms, which may in some instances be used in the commission of crimes, loaned out, not accounted for, etc. I can I can only respond to you by saying I know for a fact that um, the Ministry of National Security has embarked on red, having all security firms registered. All right. Uh, the mere fact that they they looked at the fact that anyone can become a security officer. So that has been monitored, and I think, as I said before, the Commission of Police is having something to, to do or have an investigation or would, is looking into it deeper. And as I said, he would be better able to give you more. On Understood. That, but to your knowledge, is there any protocol that you know about that monitors the operations of these private security firms presently uh, uh, by the TT Police Service? Yes, I, uh, there should be, sir. There should be. I. And I know for a fact that they're all security firms are supposed to be compliant with the Ministry of National Security. And so you register, you have the, the type of uniform that you ought to be in and all these things and the process that you ought to follow in having security officers. Is it conceivable to you and, and your colleagues that if we have a problem of confidence in some some suggest many members of the TT Police Service that the monitoring of those private institutions should also be of concern, given the, the important position security operations are playing or should play in Trinidad and Tobago at this critical point in our history. In the United States, and otherwise, um, you know the procedures, um, you scanned electronically and all of that. Sometimes they even take a swab of your hands to see whether you handled narcotics within the last few hours, packing a suitcase or some such thing. Um, at the airport here, Mr. Ferguson, uh, what screening processes do we have for people and I'm raising people because people import narcotics, and we're dealing with firearms, eh? but um, I know of a case where a man came through here with a firearm from Grenada some time ago, eh? but that's a separate matter. But what processes do we have for screening cargo at the airport to give us comfort that our safety is considered? Chairman, I'd like to ask the head of security to expound on that matter, please. Yes, thank you. Who's this, Colonel Griffith? Yes. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, most travelers would be aware of the level of checks that they go through once they or prior to boarding an aircraft. And uh, the checks tend to be pretty much the same whether or not you're traveling domestically or internationally. Now, there are some things that the 
traveler would be familiar with, like for instance, the examination of his hand luggage, her hand luggage, physical person, and so on, because they're directly exposed to that. But there are other things that go on behind the scenes that they would not necessarily be aware of as it, is, as, as it relates to searches and scans and so on. And uh, naturally, I would not like to go into too much detail at this juncture as far as some of those measures are concerned. To address the point you were making a while ago with regard to being swabbed and uh, having your hands and, and um, baggage and devices and so on, Rub down. We do, talk, we do take those measures at both international airports, Piaco and ANR. Um, because of the nature of the flows of traffic and so on, and because of the fact that the traveling, but commercial travel is very time sensitive in terms of um, meeting the aircraft time and what have you, there are some checks that must be performed randomly as opposed to being performed in every single passenger because performing them on every single passenger would, be, would take far too long, especially if you think in terms of a commercial jet taking in excess of 100 passengers and so on. But um, I would nevertheless like to take the opportunity to assure you and the members of a committee that several of the checks that you have described do in fact go on in our environment. <clears throat> um, I can speak to baggage, in terms of baggage that is leaving the country in, on, on the same flight in most instances of a, um, with a passenger. If we talk about cargo that is leaving the country or coming into the country, much of that volume is handled by the Customs and Excise Division as opposed to the Airports Authority Security Force. what is happening in respect of incoming cargo. <coughs> Thank you, and Chairman. What systems are in place to ensure that firearms are not easily coming in on us? Well, as an offshoot to what I would have explained with the containerized cargo, mm. there are two aspects to cargo coming into the territory by air. Yes. There are dedicated cargo carriers, which would only be transporting cargo, and then there are, there, there are the normal commercial airliners who will be bringing cargo as part of the complement with the passengers. So it works both ways. At present, without revealing too much, there is a mechanism, there is a mechanism for screening. Is it sufficient? I would say not. Um, do, we, do we have systems in place to increase that uh, more or less pre-screening because as it stands now we we would rely on physical examination to really determine to really determine the contents of those packages uh, what we see happening in that particular in that particular area is that we are working together with the airline companies because they also have a responsibility to see whether we can whether we can implement any non-intrusive methods of inspection prior to it coming into um, the area so designed for examination and subsequent release. But as it stands, Mr. Chairman, without again saying too much, um, there are certain mechanisms in place. And let me ask, uh, let me ask, it is well known that in some cases, light aircraft dump stuff in unwatched parts of a country. You know, it is well known. It is also well known that the firearm traffickers use unmanned submarines, especially since we heard earlier that the bulk of the firearms that are now threatening our daily lives come from our neighboring brothers and sisters in the continent of South America, and in some cases North America too. Have we seen, and anyone can police, SSA, anyone, have we seen operations of unmanned submarines in Trinidad so far? Any evidence of that? Or any serious evidence of people using light aircraft and dropping loads of things and disappearing? Okay, so there are no 
concerns about that for you as a platform? And you haven't had evidence of that just yet. Okay, Mr. Brebner. Some, something that, uh, 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 we, we made mention of it earlier with these vessels. Uh, there's a group of people that we call Yatis. Yes. All right? When they enter the country, they're supposed to, they, they are a group of people who can, who are permitted, I believe, I'm subject to correction, who can, who are permitted to have any amount of firearms on their vessels whilst at sea. All right? Um, I know when they come into... You mean Yachty's coming into our regular ports? Yes, I know Chagaramas when they, and yes, so I know when they come pause. into the country... Just pause a second. Mr. Singh, the customs is involved in this process. Yeah. Because if it's a legal port, customs yeah. are present. Yeah. Is it correct that they are permitted to come into the country with their legally obtained firearms from abroad? Or Could you explain that, please? Before so, we get back to Mr. Brett. Certainly, Brent. Chairman. Again, provision is made on, on, under the Firearms Act for such a transaction. The yachty would normally, there's a document that he has to do when presenting himself to the himself to the customs to say exactly what comprises this complement of firearms and ammunition on board that. We will take his declaration, we will take those firearms and ammunition, and if it is in the case of Shagaramas, we turn it over to the nearest police station, which will be in Digo Mountain. That is provided for in law. Okay. When he is about to leave, he will come up maybe sometime before to say that he will be He's scheduled to depart on such and such a date if we can make those items available to him, in which case we'll request again from the police station these items, and it will be presented to him upon departure. But he is not permitted to import these into the country. They are taken at the port. Taken at the port. Thank you very yeah. much. Mr. Brebner. I, my, one of the things I remember happening, happening years ago that sometimes these people would leave unknown to the customs at times and come back in. It concerns me now. I know the Coast Guard would monitor, the Customs would monitor, but these are some of the people that we need to pay a Can better possibly attention. be an opportunity for importing firearms. Yes. Because they are permitted, once you have that yacht and you pull into any port, right. you can purchase so again. Typically, Mr. Singh, so, a person may be given, a yachty appears, how long is he permitted to stay in Trinidad under the law? Usually immigration will grant him permission up to six months, depends on, depending six on months. the case. And what is, what is being said now is that during those six months, he may slip out of here. He can meet with a larger vessel midstream or somewhere out there. He can receive things and quietly come back in. Meanwhile, the record shows that he is inside but he has access to and fro. Now, if that be so, how does the customs and the Coast Guard impact that possibility? I'd like to hear starting with you. Thank you, Chairman. Well, anyone who is possessed of information like that, they should pass it on to the customs because that will be a clear breach of his terms and conditions of stay while he is in port here. So that will be seriously frowned upon. And during my tenure, I have had no evidence of such a transaction. Thank you. Coast Guard. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, similar, along the same lines of uh, what uh, Mr. Singh said, those are matters which we haven't really had being brought to our intelligence to drive that kind of operation against any particular person. Of course, if it is a pattern that is being observed, um, certainly bring it to our attention. Uh, we'd be quite happy to Well, as far as I'm concerned, it has just been brought to your attention. Well. We, we're hearing something anecdotally. I need to get a little bit more to say what, uh, from which ports, but I take, I take the Chair's guidance, sir. Thank you. Additionally, um, Coast Guard operations now, to some extent, would cater for that, which is precisely why we randomly search yachts. If you look at their papers and so on, uh, it may give you some idea as to something that doesn't fit. Um, but in a targeted operation, as the acting CEO says, not really. We haven't had intelligence to that effect. But 
one of the reasons we randomly search all types of vessels is if occurrences like these or behavior like this cannot be explained by the occupants of the vessel, then they may be taken in and, and a further search. Let me ask this august, well-paid, hard-working team. Are there any ways that you are mindful of that illegal firearms have been or can be imported into Trinidad and Tobago that we have not touched or traversed so far? It is now 4.49. We propose to wind up at 5 o'clock. So if there are, I would like to hear whether there have been or whether there can be in your professional view any means by which these dirty illegal items that kill us are coming in here that we need to be mindful of. The floor is open. Or have we touched all of them? Yes? Chairman, if... Oh, go ahead. Just recently, I learned of another way to bring drugs and guns into Trinidad and Tobago is via the jet ski. They are saying it takes approximately two hours or less to use a jet ski to move from Trinidad and Tobago to the Venezuelan coastline. And there is some compartment within the jet ski that they put these items. So we, we will need to look at that. Well, the Coast Guard will tell you that the fast boats that they use, which is why the OPVs and the interceptors, boat helicopter and speedboat interceptors came, is because we saw already in the Coast Guard where it takes just about 20, 25 minutes to speedboat into our coast. Am I correct? Yeah. Yes. So the jet ski will take about it should be faster th from what they are saying. And, yeah. and that came up, I don't want to say because but it came up. It's, it is, it's a, current, it is issue. a current scenario. So it may be that we have to start paying some attention to these to the happy... jet skis. Because if, if you look at somebody using a jet ski in the waters, it wouldn't dawn upon you that they went out of our waters and, uh, and it's coming back. You'll think they are just having fun. But that is one of the mechanisms that they use. Yes, indeed. Mr. And this could go to the TG Police Service, uh, Mr. Mr. Robinson, or members of the Coast Guard. Given what we've seen in other jurisdictions regarding terrorist attacks and the fact that we unfortunately have been tagged, a uh, somewhat high percentage per capita producer of persons seeking to become in, involved in these sorts of organizations. What, how concerned are we about military grade illegal arms coming into Trinidad and Tobago and what, I know we saw the presentation earlier on from the SSC, but what has been the finding on the ground about these types of weapons, especially in the context of terrorist activities that we're seeing becoming more frequent around the world? We have had some information about activities up in the forested areas up in the east, which is being pursued now to try to confirm. We have heard, heard about explosions, which we want to believe could be firearm training and so on. So right now, there are exercises ongoing with respect to confirming whatever activities may be happening out in that, those areas. <laughs> yes, that, that is also of concern, and um, we are even looking at it from in terms of the illegal currying that is going on, and we're looking at the land settlement agency, and you know who is responsible for areas where there is alleged persons are occupying. So it's, it's, a, it's a broad um, area that is, is concerned to us. I think we have to do some more in-depth, you know, 
inquiries in respect of quarrying on the whole. There's a lot of illegal quarrying going on, and I think we need to take a firm step and action to eradicate that as, because it's an avenue for persons even lucrative in, in terms of the occupy this portion of land and they own it and they quarrying and the, the country's being, you know, deprived of that economic wealth and so on. What is of concern to me mm -hmm. is that we do have 50 legal quarries. We do have 25. It's a handful. And a quarry is something quite visible. Why is there such a challenge in dealing with these areas of illegal quarrying, given the fact that we, we have had instances of people reporting the types of illegal activity in these areas. And also, the, the question I asked earlier, and I, I, I'm hoping that members of the TT police, if someone else can answer, how frequent are we seeing military-grade weapons in Trinidad and Tobago? That should be of grave concern. Well, I don't, we, we haven't seen any military-grade weapons. What I'm saying, what we are hearing about is some activities going on in these areas that we need to confirm. You're using the wrong term. I'm seeing some videos of some weapons that do look like pistols and revolvers. Well, AK-47s like and that type, yes. And yeah. I'm saying that, we, yes, we are concerned about that. We still don't know how it is coming, where it is coming. I think this forum here, we are trying to establish based on what has been presented that we need to find out how, when, where, and, you know, what kind of frequency are we seeing of semi-automatic weapons in the area of, in the category of AK-47s? Well, the, already, um, the statistics will show the kind of firearms that have been seized from 14 to 2017. And we have 2017 so far, there have been 83 revolvers, 230 pistols, shotguns 30, handmade shotguns 23, rifles 11, Trap guns, 33. Those are the kind of figures we have in terms of our statistics that shows. 2016, 191 revolvers. Pistols, 386. Shotguns, 79. Handmade shotguns, 48. Rifles, 28. So if you're talking about the rifles, and you know, that is of concern, it's not much that we are seeing that we are seizing that is here. There may be more, but I'm saying this is what our records will show. Should the public be concerned about, in, in the context of the, the more frequent assertions about Trinidad Tobago being a point from which persons are training in or with terrorist groups or a point of origin of persons heading to terrorist groups in terms of the possibility of those types of weapons we see carrying out horrendous terrorist activities around the world being in this country now and undetected? Well, definitely. I think that is concern to all of us. But we haven't yet confirmed. We are hearing reports of it. I'm saying efforts are ongoing to verify whatever we are hearing, persons training in these forested areas or what. And the police service is part of that operation with the Defence Force, I know. We are collaborating in trying to identify those areas and those that persons may be involved. The integrity of personnel, which we are agreed, is a major issue in terms of the deficiency of our ability to detect and to seize these firearms. I would learn recently from the FBI in the United States that every member of that organization is routinely and sometimes randomly integrity tested, but the director in the United States. You would know better than me, you all are military and police personnel and so on and customs, so you all can check that out. Do we have routine and or random integrity testing in our organization's prison? We do that. Um, 
what we have started to do with some persons who have to be deployed in sensitive areas, intelligence and that. Yes. Uh, we liaise with other persons to do polygraphs. Polygraph. Yeah. On this, but as a general rule, we do not polygraph persons, um, members of the Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you very service. much, Coast Guard. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, we do randomly. So you are able to just randomly test people. And also, and also on assignment to certain areas as well. On assignment to certain areas. Yes, sir. Defense for, um, yes, okay. Chief of Defense Staff. Yes. Um. That is the limit of the randomness. You wouldn't stop somebody in the yard and polygraph them. There must be some information leading to that action. So... Um, for sensitive areas, everybody is polygraphed, and if you have some suspicion or the other, then that person would be to go along with an investigation. Airport Authority Security. Yes, indeed. Yeah. I want um, who issue. are you, sir? Hayden Newton, General Manager of the Airport Authority. General Manager, yes. Thank you. Our national security program under the Civil Aviation requires that we do periodic background checks and investigative checks on all employees of the airport's authority. That's a part of their contract of employment and that is done. We haven't gone to the extent of doing polygraph testing, no. We do polygraph testing only for security personnel in terms of their recruitment and their engagement. So that's it. Port Authority, sorry, yes, Port Authority. Yes, indeed, could you identify yourself yet again? Good afternoon, Charmaine Lewis. Yes. For our recruitment, we similar to Airports Authority. We do testing, we do background checks, um, we do psychometric psychometric testing as well, but we don't do polygraphs. Is it that? Why not? And that's a well known and well established means for testing, other than the way we, by which we the way we look. Well, it's certainly something that we can look into, but traditionally, we, we never did polygraph. Customs. Thank you, Senator. Uh. <laughs> yes, he overheard a whisper. <laughs> overheard a whisper. Yes, but that was not intended for you. <laughs> yes. Just so that I don't be left out. The extent of our background checks, we rely on our sister agency, the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service, to provide us with certain um, information. Betting. Yes. As on entry into the organization? No, no, not necessarily. It takes place at other levels. Too. Yeah. Okay. Uh, police? Uh, at our recruiting process, we do all the system, polygraph, background check, polygraph, psycho psychometric testing and if you are going to certain specialist sections when you, you say specialist sections what do you mean for the benefit of those who may not know okay i will uh ocnfb special branch fiu some of these sensitive areas they do f polygraph but our recruiting process all the system go as it relates to Testing. But whether you work in a specialist section or not, once a man, once you are a serving officer, police, coast guard, and so on, you have the capacity to do quite a lot. I am in agreement with you, sir. you are not in a specialist section, because you can quite easily carry around stuff in a police vehicle and it's very unlikely to get attention. I agree with you, sir, but... Um there is, the legislation is really for recruits and specialist section. It, uh, there's something being prepared to have or have been mentioned over the years that all police officers should undergo some sort of polygraph Gee. or yeah, routine polygraph. Yes, yes. Uh, it, it has not yet come into effect. SSA? Yes, Chair. We 
go through the full range of background check, psychometric evaluations, and polygraphs routinely and randomly. Is polygraphing the most state-of-the-art and the most efficient way known to man for conducting these integrity tests? The, the, the polygraph chair is used in conjunction with, with, other, um, with other techniques. Um, the background check helps the polygrapher to determine how, how to interpret some of the responses that the individual will give. As well, there are some new and emergent technologies that are being included in the polygraph together with the polygraph testing. So the polygraphers, instead of using their normal equipment, they also have additional equipment that are being uh, brought into service as, polygra as polygraphers. Are we using those additional techniques in Trinidad and Tobago to your knowledge just yet? Well, I can speak for my agency. Yes. And my agency has started to uh, investigate the use of the additional techniques. All right. I promised you 5 o'clock. I've gone a little bit beyond. But I know you don't mind. You're willing to stay until 10 because you all are committed to making this place safe for your wives, your children, your, those who you love, and for those who you may not necessarily love, since it is your duty. But let me conclude on behalf of my committee to say, we thank you all very much for your being here on our request. It is very possible we will have you here again, but I want you to gear your minds towards two things. The society is in a state of Disease, as distinct from disease. There are people in my constituency and around communities in this country who report that they see citizens of this country walking around with big guns. There are people in this country who are being put out of their homes on a regular basis by persons who they know have guns. In some cases, they are afraid to speak to police organizations and defense force and otherwise, and in many cases, they do. Many cases, they do. There are persons, and this was reported to me up to last week, who go to bed routinely every night. In fact, one woman jokingly told me, if she don't hear gunshots in the night, she will not sleep comfortably. So frequent is this heavy automatic fire around her home. One gang letting the other one on the other side know we have it, and the other side firing off to let them know we have it too. And they're answering back. And this shows the ease at which they get ammunition, so much so that they can waste it in that way. And they do it, the brazenness to use Senator Richards's intervention. They do so almost certain that having advertised like an expo, nobody from law enforcement then come into shop. Nobody come in to buy. They advertise it. Look, we have it here. Brrr, and nobody comes. So our society and the people who you serve are in a serious state of trauma and disease. So as you go this evening, take these things into account. Take into account all that we have shared this evening. Take into account that we have to find accentuated ways to deal with this tsunami. And you will be called upon to provide us with answers. It is possible that you will be back. It is also possible that we will write to you and ask you collaboratively to offer to us this committee which the standing orders permit, that you tell us what needs to be done and what is required in order to do it, whether it's legislative amendments, whether it's legislative support, whether it is resources. We, this committee, under the standing orders, have a mandate to hear you 
and to assist you through the parliament in achieving those goals. So you may hear from us by way of another invitation. You may hear from us by way of a request for information, not from all of the individual entities, but one document with all of your input, a blueprint, a way forward to dealing with this gun prevalent situation in Trinidad and Tobago. Based on all that we have heard today, the citizens cannot be comforted. I don't feel comfortable as a citizen with access to you. I do not. And you as citizens cannot be comfortable with this. Members of the committee, any? Richard? Madam Oliver? In which case, on behalf of this committee, we would like to thank you and urge you to pay attention. You will hear from us very shortly. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.